Got five while your dinner's on. Got five while you're making a cuppa. Got five while you're waiting for your lucky socks to dry. Five minutes is all it takes to register to vote in the upcoming local elections. So if you've never registered or have recently moved house, visit gov.uk slash register to vote by the 17th of April. Your vote matters. Don't lose it. Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post-production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. I am out of my home studio and I am in New York. I am recording in a closet at Ars Nova Theater, an off-Broadway theater in New York. And just wanted to mention that in case you're noticing any difference in the sound quality, just a temporary situation. But uh, be back to my home studio soon. And thank you again for joining me. I got a really exciting interview with Donna Griffith today. Let's jump right in. Now, today I'm with Donna Griffith, author of Sticking to My Story, The Alchemy of Storytelling for Startups. A world-renowned corporate storyteller and pitch alchemist, Donna Griffith has roamed the globe over the last 20 years, working with over a thousand startups, Fortune 500 companies, and venture capitalists in a wide variety of industries. Donna has consulted and trained clients in over 30 countries, helping them create pitches that sing and to magically spin raw data into compelling stories that have raised over $1.5 billion. Donna, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Becky. And I'll just say this has been an incredible experience working with you all on this audiobook. You have been professional beyond belief. I can't believe how fast we got it done. And I'm so grateful that I found you. I really am. Oh, thanks. It's been an absolute delight working with you as well. So let's jump into sort of the beginning. I'd actually love to hear a little bit more about your background. What what were you like as a kid? Did you have lines forming for your lemonade stand? Oh, my gosh. That's so cute. A waiting list for party clowning. (laughs) So the party clowning, it's interesting because the past week I had my two live launch events here in the Bay Area, one in Palo Alto on the day of the apocalyptic storm, which felt very apropos to my love for Shakespeare. It was a real Shakespearean storm. Mm, And then last night in San Francisco, and I put together a speech that kind of was a series of serendipitous moments that led to writing the book and also the serendipity of recording the audio book as, as, as fast as it did and finding you all. I, I took people back to like before I was an author, before I was a storyteller. I was a early stage entrepreneur, a very early stage entrepreneur. And at the age of seven, I identified a problem, a need, just like many entrepreneurs do. My sister was turning four and there were no affordable and fun options for birthday party entertainment. So being the scrappy little thing that I was, I dug through clothes, found a hearts covered jumpsuit, high 80s, high mom things, drew some hearts on my cheeks and I was hearts the clown. And then I got a $50 VC investment after a very successful MVP. That was a lot of money back then. Went to Sears, got a wig and got makeup rebranded as Rainbow the Clown. Marketing budget, I mimeographed flyers, hung them around the schools, and I quickly achieved break even and even ROI. But the problem was I didn't have a good attorney and I had no dilution clause in my term sheet. So my VC, my darling mother to this day, is still <laughs> leaning the dividends off of that. But I hope that I've returned the investment in many ways for her as well. So I had early kind of forays into the world of entrepreneurship, but I've never had a job. I've mm-hmm. never had a nine to five job. Like I, I did a stint when I was in college working for the college like, placement agency. Yeah. And I still so bored after that, after four months that I had to leave. But and I've always been my own business owner or consultant. And I've gotten to travel the globe doing what I love. I've always loved acting. 
Mm -hmm. Theater has had a huge impact on my life and on the book for those of you that will listen to it now or have listened to it. Theater is a huge part of how I communicate and how I help other people communicate the way plays are structured, the drama of it, the story. And having that as part of my life from a very young age and falling in love with New York and Broadway, it took me there to get my master's degree in drama therapy because I wanted something that was as loving and satisfying to me as acting, but could also provide me with a serious job. And then I found that salary of a drama therapist was basically that of a starving artist. And I did not want to be waiting tables at the age of 30. I'm like, there's got to be something else. Yeah. And one time, one of my, the whole, I got to the master's degree at NYU that I had drummed about from the age of 16 and made this discovery. And one of my professors happened to say in one lecture that she had a friend who traveled around the world and gave workshops and inspired people. It was like one of those hallelujah angels singing, well, hallelujah moments. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I want to do. What is this? A corporate story? No, it wasn't corporate story. It was corporate training at the time. I'm like, and then luckily at NYU at the same time, there was a program for training in organizational development for a post master's degree. And I just signed right up, sent my first resume out to the first job position I saw on Craigslist of all places. (laughs) Yeah. And I met the wonderful Brad, Brad Boyer, who was very pivotal in my career. And we had a great interview and he's like, you know, all looks good on paper, but I need to see you on stage. I said, well, just so happens I'm in an (laughs) off-Broadway show. I was playing an Irish lass called Deirdre in a show called Nara's Glow. Back in circa 19, it was a World War II, myself and my sisters. So I have that line. So he came to see the opening night and he called me the next day to tell me that I had been hired because the stage lit up when I came out, which was like, wow, somebody actually sees you in that way and sees the spark in you. And then I set off on this amazing tour of the world, teaching people how to create stories, how to create messages, chips to chips, from silicon chips to potato chips to chocolate chip companies. <laughs> we covered the whole gamut. <laughs> and in everywhere from Shanghai, China to Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And it just was incredible to see how universally stories resonate, how yeah. people struggle with the same information overload and wanting how do you tell it in a way that they get it and you look smart and all was wonderful until 2008. <laughs> yeah, that the was a rough day. year. <laughs> oh my God. And suddenly <laughs> everything just shut down and I yeah. had like all the work on my calendar was gone and I was like, oh my gosh, what now? Do I get a job in the middle of a recession? I never had no. a job. <laughs> how do you do that? And serendipity once again led me on this path to startup storytelling. I had done some, I studied coaching and NLP and the man that I studied with had a client that needed help with his speeches. He was a cardiothoracic surgeon, incredible guy. And he was the head of the cardiothoracic and the cardiologist society who apparently are like the jets and the sharks. I did not know this. I I didn't know that. Great, great. (laughs) And both working on the heart, but very different approaches. Um, And as I was helping him write his speeches, he had created two medical devices and they were just extraordinary. And he had been invited to this big angel conference in New York. And he said, do you think you could help me with the startup pitches? Cue angels singing and I'm like, well, (laughs) never worked on a startup before, but hey, story's a story. I've always been one to say yes and then figure (laughs) it out. Yes. And yep. Yep. Good. (laughs) And so I was like, okay. And then I dove head straight into this whole world of go-to-market and valuations and business models and all these things. I don't come from a finance background or a technical background or a regulatory background. Like I had to learn a lot in a lot of time. And then we got to New York. He actually asked me to present on his behalf. He made me a contingent team member. I don't usually do that. But in this case, with someone of his stature, it was acceptable. And I worked so hard on these two five-minute pitches. Like I, I practiced the heck out of them. And then the other companies that came got up to speak. And I was like, what is going on here? Before they even had a chance to open their mouths, the investors, we're talking like 80 something angel investors sitting in the same room, shot them down. Wow. And started, they couldn't even get a sentence out of their mouth. And I'm like, why wouldn't they work with someone like me? They have this multi-million dollar opportunity. And then I'm like, okay, well, wait a minute. And I started looking and nobody had 
cornered the market on startup storytelling. This was before it, people were even knew what storytelling was. So people, I would say storytelling to be like, oh, like a librarian. <laughs> okay. Not exactly. No. So I said, okay, this is my niche. I'm going to work with startups. Now, between the decision of working with startups and actually having startups pay for it, there's a gap. I established what I call the SPAS model. The sponsorship as a service. I approached all the accelerators that were popping up at back then, again, 2009. In the wake of any financial crisis, and I know we're going to be seeing it now, startups pop up like mushrooms after an apocalyptic river, (laughs) which is what we've had here. (laughs) And so I just started offering my services saying, listen, let me work on the pitches. You don't have to pay me, but I do ask you to treat me as a sponsor, put my logo up there and thank me at the events because I wanted my name to start to become synonymous with the startup pitches. At first, they're like, sorry, we just want money. (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of getting called in like urgently two days before a conference or a demo day. Like, can you come help with the pitches? They're not very good. I was like, of course, with pleasure. And suddenly startup pitches started singing and people were hearing like, who's this Donna person? Who's this Donna person? And they started finding me. If you build it, they will come. And that has been like the pivotal journey. And I knew I had a book. I knew I had a book to write. But how do you write a book? (laughs) It's a whole new set of skills. It's a whole new set of skills. And every time I'd write a blog or something about pitching, I'm like, oh, that's a good chapter for the book. Oh, that's a good chapter for the book. But then nothing materialized. Yeah. And serendipitous moment number three. Vince Warren, I interviewed on his podcast. He's this wonderful marketing expert from New Zealand. He's got a podcast called Chasing the Inside. And in one of our prep calls, he just happened to mention that he had a publishing company called ATG, All the Geeks Publishing. And again, Q Angels. I'm like, tell me more. And I love their process. They actually work with people to help empower them to become authors. It's not just okay, write a book, we'll edit it and publish it. It's like the thought process, the outline. And I told him, this is only going to work if I have an accountability meeting with you every week. I must have that because I know myself. I'll just sweep it under the rug because I'm too busy with too much. I've got a business and I've got kids and life. And he said, sure. And every week for May 15th, 2022, we had a meeting either that we met or I used that time to write. And I say sometimes the book wrote itself. It was like a muse came through me, the flow, the Chicxulubali flow of like being in that moment. And in October, I handed in my first draft. And here we are, <laughs> less here. than a year from my initial foray into this. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that is quite a journey and exciting to hear all the different pieces and those, the angel moments. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> love that little flare of drama in there never hurts. So. Yeah, yeah. So you've been out there doing this for a while. Tell us a little bit of, about like the impact that you are seeing, that you're having with the work that you're doing. If somebody called me the polisher of diamonds, and I find that so apropos and so poignant because I get to work every single day with brilliant companies who are truly changing the world, but they're They've obscured themselves with a lot of data and facts and figures and numbers and technical babble and people aren't seeing their luster. And I get to come along and chip away at those layers of cobwebs and dust and coal and what have Mm. you. So the diamond actually shines. And I'm very proud to have over 400 recommendations on my LinkedIn with clients that are so dear to me. And Clients that come back either with their next round, with their sales deck, or their next company. Last time at my launch event, one of my clients who he, I worked with him a few years back and he exited and now he's working on a new company and we worked on his current deck. And to me, that's the biggest testament. And, and with the book, I'm getting emails from all over the world, people saying, thank you for writing this. Thank you for writing this. Finally, I know what to do. And that's why I wrote this, Becky, because I can't scale myself. There's one of me. I I am Donna GPT. I swear that OpenAI has somehow found a way to train on my brain. I can't prove it. But (laughs) But I've been doing this for years, intaking mounds of data and then spitting out these beautiful stories that that just tell it. And I get so into it when I'm writing that I'm like totally living their story. And 
the book for me, especially in a recession, and we are heading into so much uncertainty and everything that's happened in Silicon Valley Bank and everything the past few weeks, I want this in the hands of every single startup founder out there or on the, in the earbuds of them. Think that's right. another reason we put the audio book out because okay. people are like, are you going to translate it to other languages? I'm like, I'm not sure, but at least the audio book will give access to people. Right. And if I can help people get the clarity that they need to write it and to be able to give a successful pitch. And someone that came, a founder that I know came to my event on Tuesday, she just posted, she's like, it made me go back to my origin story of why I started my company. And that's exactly what I want. And that's the impact that I want to give the gift of storytelling to these very techie, startup-y, business -y people. Yeah. And then them having that experience, what does that do for you? Well, first of all, I'm thrilled. It warms my heart, but it also gives me a lot of validation because when you're writing a book, you're kind of in your own insular world. And you're like, is what I'm writing good? Is it like that? And is this going to impact anyone? I know I've been talking about this for years. I know I've given workshops for years. And once you start getting out of your own circle of people that know you and trust you and start hearing it from outside, then it starts to resonate like, oh, wow, this works. You've done this. And to me, that's, that's everything. I want to establish myself as the leader for startup storytelling, if not for business storytelling. So it's really exciting and it's really moving and emotional and so many things happening at once. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. It's really great. Would you say, is there like a single message or, or any one thing that you feel like that you really want your listeners, your readers to take away from the book? Yes, there is. Stories stick. And that's really the reason for the title. And I keep coming back to how true that is. So the stories I tell of the founders that uses founder stories in the book have stuck with me for years. And one of them, Kira Life, who I write about, and it's called The Healing Story, about Ron, who started this crazy journey because his father, at the age of 56, was diagnosed with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and went from being this vibrant man to being a shadow of himself needing a nap every day. And nothing was helping. Nine months watching his diet, watching his weight, and taking his oral insulin, his glucose levels were increasing rather than decreasing. And Ron set out on this odyssey, traveling the world, looking for anything from Serbia to Africa to India that could help his father. And he created, he found this supplement that actually, we can't say cure diabetes, but made it manageable. And he's helping over hundreds of thousands of people with this. And so the case in point, a few weeks ago, he asked me to work with his VP sales and director of sales US on the sales deck. And I said, of course, I'd be thrilled to. And they send me a deck which looked very pretty. And I'm like, where's Ron and Rafi's story? And they said, oh, well, we're meeting with companies like Whole Food. We have such a quick meeting with them. We don't really have time to talk about their story. I'm like, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because they see companies all the time that have supplements and herbs and all natural and supply chain and blah, blah, blah. They see so many of those. Yeah. Yeah. But you're the company that had, was passionate enough to care enough to want to truly change this. And that, guess what? Turns out that both the VP sales and the director of sales had fathers who had been diagnosed with diabetes midlife. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I was like having this, like I'm jumping up and down. Oh, I've got you. Like, what's the story? This is the company. I want pictures of you all with your families and the impact you've truly made because this is a personal thing. And when you have a story like that, how can you not tell it? I don't care. Let them, they'll extend the meeting to ask about your supply chain and your, your organic and non-GMO and whatever. That's what they're going to remember. And that's what they're going to go back to the boardroom and say, we met this company today that are truly changing the life of people diagnosed with diabetes. They're truly moving the needle. Oh my gosh, how cool that we have this on our shelf. Let's put it front and center. Yeah. That's a story that sticks. Yeah, so never great. give up the story because you think you don't have enough time. People will make time for the stories because stories resonate. I just had an article come out about me today and I learned something new. Apparently there was a study done in California where they took people, an actual sample of their blood before a meeting where they heard from a father who was trying to raise 
funding for a son, his son who had some kind of horrible disease. And then they took the blood afterwards and they found increased levels of both cortisol, the mm. stress hormone, right. and, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on when the uh, oxytocin, mm -hmm. just the empathy and sympathy. And it's what you feel when you're an early stage mom and fall in love with your child. So the cortisol, like they felt the stress when the father was telling the story and the empathy. And apparently the higher the level, the higher the donations were. Oh my goodness. Wow. Isn't that <laughs> incredible? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm reading this article about, I just learned something new. So scientifically, we are measuring the impact of storytelling. And if you're out there trying to raise funding, not necessarily philanthropic, but that as well, or sell your product or get people to join your journey or partner with people. Isn't that what you want? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Beautiful. stories thick. Stories yeah. thick. Beautiful. And going forward, like what you've been powering through this piece of your of the journey with your book and your audio book, what's your aspiration with it moving forward? World domination. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had to, Becky. You just you made that one too easy. So First of all, when I started writing the book, I was going to be just about the alchemy of storytelling in general. And I start going through the outline with Vince. He's Donna, I'm sorry, unless you want to write a 500 page book, you've got about three books here. So probably I'm going to have to write another book or two. I need to rest for a moment with this, but I want to get out there and speak. I want to be able to spread the gospel about storytelling and make it accessible because I had somebody write me the other day. He had an offsite with his team and he works for a big tech company in Vegas. He bought copies for all of them. He said, I treat them. They work in a big or a corporation, but I treat them as a startup. So I think this can be helpful for anyone in any constellation. And yeah, I just want to really make storytelling, give this gift back because in an era of TikTok and Instagram, we've come full circle with our primal brain, which 30,000, 40,000 years ago started to tell stories with cave painting and hieroglyphics before we even had language. It's this primal need to tell our story and to have it preserved from generation to generation. And now we're back to the visuals, to the short bits of stories. So storytelling is so inherent in our lives how can we then take that and leverage our business lives with it? Yeah, great. Let's pause for a moment. We'll be right back. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70%, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out, or at least shrink, the middleman. Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. Pro Audio Voices hears you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% royalties of the price you set that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com in the marketing menu. All right, let's talk a little bit more specifically, sort of jump into the audiobook production process and some of that. So you were super clear from the start, and I understand this totally from your background and everything you and I share actually a lot in, in terms of our some of these qualities from our background. You were very clear from the start you wanted to narrate your own audiobook. Did you need to set up a studio at your own home? Yeah, I couldn't think of anybody else telling this story other than me. And I do, among my many travails in life, I have also been a voiceover artist. It's funny, like with me, I don't let moss grow under my feet in any way. And when I was 20, I was dating someone and his dad said to me, you know, you have a very radiophonic voice. I said, really? He said, yeah, you should be on radio. The next day I had signed up for a voiceover course <laughs> and it was everything from like news casting to commercial voiceover to acting voiceover. 
And my first gig was at a mall. And now for the next half hour, we have 50% off at <laughs> Forever 21. Yes, you heard right. 50% off. Like, so I got to do a lot of practicing with that. And then that led to a lot of commercial gigs. And I did a lot of English as second language for people. And this was like the early, early, early days of online learning. Now it's just, it's everywhere. But we're talking back in 2000 and gosh, from six, eight, nine, I mean, really early days. And I, I continued doing that. So I got very comfortable with reading a lot of rote and long lists. And we had this guy there. I used to call him Henry Higgins. He'd come in and listen. He could tell you exactly where you were from. I'm from Maryland. And I always thought I had a very pretty neutral accent because mm-hmm. Maryland has that kind of borderline between the South and the North. And it's right. not Baltimore. I'm not Baltimore where they swallow it. But mm-hmm. he's, oh, yeah, you're from Maryland and you've got that. And you probably have someone who grew up in the South, too. I'm like, holy what? <laughs> and he'd pick up all these little words. We have to re-record them. And so I was like, OK, I think I can handle this technically, too. Now, setting up a studio in my house and we discussed this. I just didn't want to take the chance because I wanted to work with someone professional First of all, as a production company, which is why I wanted to work with Pro Audio. But then I, I work, I started checking around for studios and I sent out a bunch of feelers and I found Adam from Reed's Recordings and he was great, super professional. He'd done some audiobooks before, even though he mainly does music. And what's great about working with an engineer is I'm pretty good at catching my errors when I make them and the little that you yeah. kind of get and like, okay, let's go back and do that. And he could take you right back. And then what's it called? Push and punch in. Punch in. Yeah. yeah. Punch in. And I, I didn't know how long this would take. It's a crapshoot and I wanted to get it done pretty fast. And in eight hours, we recorded it four sessions and then little pickup half hour session to do the little corrections that couldn't be edited out. Most of it is fun fact, people. You may not know this. I don't know, Becky, even if anyone's ever told this. The first day after the studio, no, I talk a lot with my hands. You might have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and as I'm narrating, I was talking a lot, which was a lot of the errors, like little clicks that happened, like me knocking against the mic yeah. Yeah. or against the wire. Right. At the end of the first session, suddenly I get the alert from my Fitbit that I'd done 10,000 steps. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> my hand gestures were counting as steps. Oh, how funny. <laughs> so I was having an actual workout, but it, it registered like an aerobic workout while... <laughs> <laughs> because and anyone out there that that does want to record their own audiobook and doesn't necessarily come from that i highly suggest adding that in really gives you like that oomph of energy right to, and it was fun it was so much fun to be back behind the mic it took me right back and yeah it was an exciting and fast and furious and just so professional to to have everybody tell me we need this and we need this image and we need that bias bn and we didn't yeah. and we managed to squeeze this interview under the wire no <laughs> that's pretty amazing what would you, you've talked about a lot of the different pieces one one particular thing anything about the process of the pr- audiobook production that kind of stands out to you that you highlight thing the thought the mind shift of somebody that's going to be listening to it and not reading it which kind of okay so i sat down with your editors and okay so how do we describe this picture how do we break it down and then having that on my website so people can access it and so that was an interesting thought changing everything for in this book to in this audio book and also as i was recording you know each chapter i have okay so here's tips practical tips of what you can do and then i realized these are cataloging in that's determined voiceovers and i had to add numbers to them and we hadn't added numbers even when we did the editing because we didn't think about it and that's something i would you know suggest. and so i had to go okay one and then there's a bunch right in then uh, so i was literally holding my fingers and counting so i would remember where i was a couple of times i had to go okay adam can you take me back or did we was that one or was that three <laughs> right. and i did have one correction where i said so how do you avoid epic pitch fail number it should have been four and i said three and that was one of the re-recordings i had to do so thinking of someone listening to this and making it pleasurable enjoyable for them but not losing their train of thought being able to follow coherently along with it was there, what was the most surprising thing about it anything i think that i think that, really yeah. the the amount of thought that goes into I just thought, okay, you get there and you read your book. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> it's so like chunking it and making sure that things that seem obvious when you're reading it 
are there or not when you're audio. So that was really surprising to me. Right. And how can listeners learn more about you and your writing? What tell us your website and Donna Griffith.com. That's two F's, one T. Like Melanie without the H at the end. People won't always add on the H. My there's a story there, of course. My father-in-law is an artist and he went to school in at in Florence at the Academia del Arte. And when he was there, he reinvented his artist name. And there apparently was a boxer whose last name was Griffith. Now, I don't know if it was Griffiths or Griffith. I have to look that up sometime, but he just did it with that. <laughs> uh, so DonnaGriffith.com, StickingToMyStory.com. Fun little fact there. When I started with Vince and I told him that this is the title I'd had in mind for many years. I had a workshop called Sticking To My Story. We looked it up. He's the dot coms available. I'm like, you're kidding me. If there's not been a book written called Sticking To My Story. I'm like, you're kidding me. And then I was like... I've got the URL. I've got the URL. And somebody said to me, great. The book is half written. You've got the URL. Woo-hoo. But it's true. And yeah. that was really a moment of clarity of, oh, wow, this is actually happening. Have a book. I also knew who I was going to dedicate it to. Very clear to me. Yeah. And when it kind of, it's very emotional when you have that dedication. Yeah. Even before you've written the book, it's you can see it coming to life. So right. com, sticking to my story.com. The book is available on Amazon. Enjoy it. Well, it will be available, of course, on Audible and all. And you can probably tell us what other voice sites. Yeah. Yeah. I would actually, we talked a lot about impact, having an impact. And one of the places that your audiobook is going to be available, should be by the time this interview is live will be on Amplify Audiobooks, which is the place to have the biggest impact. And the audiobook will also be available in all your favorite audiobook retailers and libraries and music channels. But in the Amplify Audiobook store is going to have, again, the most impact. I'm so excited. I'm so yeah. exciting. Oh, a lot of people have been like writing me, coming up. when's Audible coming out? When's Audible coming out? Because people today really have come back to this kind of audio storytelling because we're doing something while we're doing something else. We're working yeah. out, we're running, we're driving. My husband listens to podcasts incessantly. And to be able to not have your hands and your eyes occupied reading. Some people love the feel of a book. Some people have been like, I need to feel the book. And I'm like, great. Some people are like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Donna, thank you so much. This has been really fun. Becky, Um, thank you. And thank your whole team, Geralee and and Shayna and everyone. They've just, seriously, I had no idea a month or so ago that this even existed, a company that produces your art. I didn't know. I didn't think. You think like, sure, I'll do it. But I want to say this to all authors out there. It's really, this is your one shot. You want to make it good. It's You've already written the book. You've already gone through this whole thing. You've already published. It's worth the investment to go and work with someone who's truly professional. And Becky is not paying me to say this. This is sort of like no discount. But <laughs> seriously, it's such a different experience when you've got this crew behind you. And we haven't even started amplifying it or getting it out there. This is like So I feel in such good hands. So thank you for that. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you. Well, that's going to be a wrap for this for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at ProAudioVoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.